All right, so for this final video of lecture 10, I just want to sort of take a look back um, at what we've learned uh, from the analysis of selfish mining, these deviations from um, honest behavior and Nakamoto consensus, uh, and also discuss a bit about um, what, if anything, uh, all of this has to do with practice. So first of all, right, the main takeaway from this lecture is that, you know, you can introduce a cryptocurrency um, into your blockchain. Um, you can use it to give nodes rewards for creating blocks. Um, but in Nakamoto consensus, you actually, you know, probably despite one's intuition, you're not necessarily incentivizing nodes to honestly follow the longest chain uh, consensus protocol. Or phrased in the language of game theory, it is not always the case that all of the nodes honestly following the protocol constitutes a Nash equilibrium. Uh, we've seen that there are situations where actually one node does have a unilateral incentive um, to deviate from the all honest outcome. And we saw three different versions of this argument. The simplest one is where you have one node with 51% of the hash rate, and then there's a quite simple strategy for that node uh, that always orphans all honestly produced blocks, thereby guaranteeing it 100% um, of the block rewards, which is obviously better than honest behavior, which would give it only 51% of the block reward. Um, then we thought about the case where there was no big node. Okay, so we we're thinking about nodes with less than 50% of the hash rate. Um, but we're also in that middle analysis, assuming that the deviating node was able to um, control how honest nodes break ties between competing longest chains. Um, and so there we saw a slightly more complicated strategy, um, which actually boosts um, your share of the block rewards, no matter what your hash rate is. So for every alpha, um, uh, for every hash rate alpha, you would do better, specifically alpha divided by one minus alpha, you get a higher fraction of the block rewards by using that strategy. And we also saw that that's sort of a, a tight result in the sense that it matches the chain quality um, guarantee we proved for longest chain consensus back in lecture number eight. Most recently, in the last sort of optional video, we had the third and by far most technical version uh, of this argument, right? So that's where we considered the scenario where the deviating node, node A, neither does it have 51% of the hash rate, uh, nor does it have the ability to coordinate how the honest nodes break ties among longest chains, which in some sense is the most appropriate setting for this type of analysis. And so what we learn there by considering a, a still more complex strategy, but in the same spirit um, of all of these selfish mining strategies, um, is that even their deviations from honest behavior um, can help, can boost the share of, a blo of block rewards of a node. Now that's only true if the node is sufficiently big, has more than a third uh, of the hash rate, um, but that's still uh, an interesting result, right? You might've thought that things break down only when a node has 51% of the overall hash rate, um, but that final analysis shows that even um, all the way down at 34% at, uh, of the hash rate, uh, you've got incentive issues in Nakamoto consensus. So in all three cases, we proved something that, you know, in some sense, from a game theory perspective, was sort of modest. Um, we just took uh, one candidate outcome, namely all of the nodes following the protocol honestly. We showed that it's not a Nash equilibrium, i.e. some node has an incentive to deviate to boost its share of the block rewards. Uh, we never discussed, like, what a Nash equilibrium might be. Right? So if it's not all nodes following the protocol, it's got to be something else. Um, but actually, that's, that's just going to be a really difficult question for a game with such complex strategy spaces. Um, as this one. So for the most part, um, in, in the academic literature in this line of work, one doesn't discuss what the Nash equilibrium, what the Nash equilibrium is, other than just whether everybody um, following the protocol honestly happens to be one. Speaking of the academic literature, um, this paper I mentioned by Eyal and Sarir that was uh, published in 2014, it's been very influential, a um, ton of follow-up work with all kinds of different variations of what you've seen in this lecture. Um, so for example, you know, other versions of Nakamoto consensus like pre-merge Ethereum, um, Ethereum 1.0 had sort of a, a variation on Bitcoin's version of Nakamoto consensus with some small differences. So people analyzed to what extent you can do these attacks there. Um, also, people have looked at sort of different proof of stake designs. As we'll see in lecture 12, there's a million different ways to design proof of stake blockchain. So there's sort of a lot of different selfish mining style analyses um, you can do there. People have looked at refinements of the attack that would be sort of more difficult for other nodes to detect uh, and on and on. So tons, dozens of follow-up papers um, I'll put um, citations to a few entry points to that literature uh, in the lecture notes. So, as you can tell, in the academic sphere, this has been very, very influential work. You'd be natural to ask, okay, so is this just kind of, are we just doing like math for fun, or what are the implications in practice? And in particular, you might be wondering, okay, if this sort of selfish mining strategies is such a good idea, um, do we see them in practice? Uh, and at least for Bitcoin, which is by far the biggest and most widely used protocol based on Nakamoto consensus, um, there's no evidence that we've ever seen um, 
nodes use strategies uh, of this sort. There are various smaller blockchains that use Nakamoto consensus, including various forks of Bitcoin. I don't know that people have carefully looked at those um, for evidence of these kinds of attacks, um, but at least in Bitcoin, we have not seen them at any point in the 13 years that it's been running. And so it's natural to ask, you know, like, why might that be? How can we explain the fact that this um, uh, deviation that in theory would seem to be good for nodes running, let's say the Bitcoin protocol, why don't they actually take advantage of it? Now, first, just kind of naive straw man answer would be, you know, maybe our model in this lecture of nodes as profit maximizers is just inappropriate. Maybe nodes don't really worry, you know, about crazy strategies. Maybe the people running the nodes just kind of want to run the protocol. And that's the end of the story. That may well have been true for the first like year or two of Bitcoin's existence when it was still kind of a very um, small community of enthusiasts um, that were participating. Uh, but speaking now, speaking in 2022, we have many, many, many examples um, where nodes running some blockchain protocol are obviously acting in their own best interest, deviating from what was originally intended by the protocol designer. Some of these deviations that have been seen are at the level of the consensus protocol. So for example, the Ethereum Classic blockchain um, has suffered from uh, multiple large reorganizations over um, its lifetime, uh, which facilitated double spends. So that's obviously one form of deviation by a node. Uh, and then these days, we also see a ton of deviations that are targeting sort of the application layer. So especially if you have DeFi, decentralized finance, sort of built on top of a blockchain, there's kind of lots of ways to kind of siphon money off uh, of the application layer um, if you're one of the nodes running the protocol. We'll talk much more about that toward the end of the lecture series. But point being, I mean, it's clear at this point that many nodes running blockchain protocols are indeed willing to deviate from intended behavior if it's in their own best interest. So that leaves this question open. Why aren't we seeing these um, specific selfish mining strategies in practice, specifically, for example, uh, for the Bitcoin protocol? And I'm going to suggest sort of multiple possible explanations. You know, realistically, the, the you know, reality is probably some mix of these possible answers. And the mix of those answers may even be different for different nodes that might contemplate deviating from the protocol. Let me start with the most frequent response you'll hear from people. And just to warn you, I'm actually not, um, I'm actually not that convinced by this answer, but you will hear it over and over again. So the story here goes that um, any such attack, any such deviation um, would crash the price of the native currency. So for example, Bitcoin and the Bitcoin protocol, uh, thereby destroying the wealth of the attacker and making the attack actually not in the attacker's interest. And implicit in sort of this response is a number of assumptions, some of which I think are pretty tenuous. The first assumption, you know, which I'm sort of okay with, um, is that if there is such a deviation, that's going to be noticed um, by the community and by the public. I find this assumption semi-acceptable just because, you know, public blockchains, you know, like Bitcoin are so public, right? So everybody can see everything that's uh, going on. And so for the strategies we've talked through here in lecture 10, you could imagine looking for like unusual patterns in the orphaning of blocks that would suggest that some node um, was engaging in these kind of selfish mining strategies. Um, there is recent work um, about sort of variations uh, of the strategies we've talked about um, in this lecture that are better disguised, harder to detect. But still, you know, most shenanigans in blockchains do actually come to light, it would seem. Um, and so again, this maybe is an okay assumption. The second assumption, which I actually think is, is much less true than many people believe, is that somehow like a publicly noticed attack would have a big impact on the price of Bitcoin, right? Like, I don't know, it would drop by a factor of five or 10. And this empirically is just not true. Again, we haven't seen sort of these selfish mining attacks in Bitcoin, so we don't really have any evidence on whether it would be true for that specific attack on that specific blockchain protocol. But there's lots of other blockchain protocols that have suffered various types of attacks, right? I mentioned the large scale reorganizations that have plagued Ethereum Classic over and over again. And they often lead to kind of a short term dip in the native currency's um, price, but it often bounces back pretty quick and there's not really any um, long term effects, it would seem. Now, you know, the counter argument would be, eh, you know, Ethereum Classic is a small chain. It's somehow already priced in that there's going to occasionally be these big attacks on it. And for something like Bitcoin, it's not priced in because people don't expect um, that there are going to be these sort of um, attacks on it. Eh, maybe, <laughs> you know, I just don't find it that convincing. I just, I'm not convinced that price is as sensitive um, to uh, various types of attacks as people seem to believe. 
But for the sake of argument, let's suppose actually it does lead to a crash. Let's suppose the price of Bitcoin drops by a factor of 10 or 100 um, after some selfish mining deviation is noticed by the public. Uh, then the final part of this story says that the attacker would lose its wealth. Okay? And if all of the attacker's wealth was just sort of tied up in Bitcoin, um, then you know this would be true, right? So all they have, all they have in their portfolio is Bitcoin. Price of Bitcoin drops by a factor of ten or hundred. The attacker's wealth drops by a factor uh, of ten or hundred, right? But on the other hand, like who says this attacker is holding Bitcoin? So the counter argument here would go like this: It's like okay. You know, maybe the attacker actually doesn't kind of have much Bitcoin, right? Maybe, for example, whenever they produce a block in, in the Bitcoin protocol and they get a block reward of six and a quarter Bitcoins, maybe they just sell it immediately for USD, so they never actually hold any Bitcoin. Um, but still, right, to, to have any influence over the protocol at all, it has to have some fraction of the hash rate. It needs to have some positive alpha. And moreover, at least for the Bitcoin protocol, the total amount of hash rate is so big the only way you could possibly capture even a tiny percentage of the overall hash rate would be to invest a significant amount in specialized hardware, so-called ASICs, right, which are machines that are really good at evaluating SHA-256 uh, and can't do anything else. So while the attacker is perhaps not invested in the currency, it needs to at least be invested uh, in specialized hardware that's good only for participating um, in this one protocol. And then if the price of Bitcoin went to zero, then the value of all this specialized hardware would also go down to zero. Because again, the only thing it's good for um, is for producing blocks in Bitcoin, you know, and the only economic value there is whatever you get from six and a quarter Bitcoins. And so if that's zero, the value of this hardware also becomes zero. So, you know, I, I think there's some merit to that argument. You know, I think it's, probably fair to say that uh, most participants, at least specifically the Bitcoin protocol, um, probably either feel or just genuinely are economically invested in the health of the protocol and its currency, and so therefore sort of disinclined to do anything that they believe might harm the protocol um, and its currency. But I, I still think there's a lot left to explain. I don't think actually this argument has that much force. Right, so like, for example, a very interesting natural experiment happened just a couple months before the time of this recording, um, which is that the Ethereum blockchain went through the merge, which means it switched from proof of work, um, civil resistance. So with participating nodes solving these hard crypto puzzles, again, using specialized hardware, um, and it switched to proof of stake civil resistance, where block production is really just kind of determined by internal randomness of the protocol. So the merge then was actually a super interesting natural experiment uh, for exactly this argument. Because with the merge, no matter what the proof of work um, node participants did, their specialized hardware's value was going to go to basically zero because there was going to be no more um, sort of uh, proof of work block production after the merge. And despite that, despite the fact that their hardware was basically going to go to value zero anyways, we still didn't really see any examples of these selfish mining strategies leading up um, to the merge. So that to me suggests that actually it's just really, um, there must be other explanations as well. Uh, second possible answer to the question, which actually I think probably is a, is a reasonable explanation in many cases, is that would-be deviators, would-be attackers just find it difficult to get the capital necessary to benefit from these kinds of attacks. Because remember, right, in the third scenario we looked at, so that's where the deviator doesn't have control over the communication network. That is, it can't really influence how the honest nodes are breaking ties among competing longest chains. There, you actually needed a third of the overall hash rate um, for that deviation to actually matter. If you have well less than a third of the hash rate, you may as well um, just honestly follow the protocol. And, you know, for a protocol like Bitcoin, getting a third of the hash rate is not an easy thing to do. So um, there's just very few entities that are in a position um, to get that much hash rate uh, in the Bitcoin protocol. Now, we did have that second scenario also, where actually you can boost your block rewards even if you have only like 1% or 0.1% of the overall hash rate. But that assumed that actually you, while you were deviating, could control how the honest nodes break ties which you could do if you had like total power over the communication network, but like, how are you gonna get that? That's again, something that not that many people, not that many entities are gonna be in, in a position to achieve. So that I think might be the first order explanation um, about why we just don't see these, these types of deviations. 
Um, another thing which I don't feel like is discussed enough is that it would actually take a long time for this deviation to pay off, let's say specifically in the Bitcoin protocol. Because remember, this attack, fundamentally, it's an attack on the difficulty adjustment um, system of Nakamoto consensus. And at least in Bitcoin specifically, difficulty stays fixed, except it's updated once every two weeks. And if you think about it, there's actually no benefit of this deviation whatsoever up until the point that the difficulty adjusts. Let me just briefly remind you, you know, why difficulty adjustment is sort of so crucial um, for these deviations here in lecture 10, why it's really pretty specific to Nakamoto consensus along with its proof of work civil resistance, resistance mechanism and the, the difficulty adjustment. So difficulty adjustment, that's, that's why, you know, we focused just on sort of the fraction of the pie that the deviating node was earning. We didn't worry about the size of the pie. And, the re and so because we said the size of the pie is always fixed. There's nothing the node can do about the size of the pie. All it can do is increase its share. That's why the node was focused on orphaning honestly produced blocks. Okay, that's how it, max that's how it increases its share of the overall pie. The reason the size of the pie is fixed, that's because of difficulty adjustment. Okay, so and there's sort of two things going on. You know, first of all, block rewards are doled out only for blocks on the longest chain. Nothing else matters. Secondly, difficulty adjustment um, adjusts so that the rate of growth of the longest chain is fixed. So for example, in Bitcoin, it's targeting in a given two week window, there's gonna be 2016 new blocks added to the longest chain. Those are also exactly the blocks produced in those two weeks that are going to be earning block rewards. So the block reward of six and a quarter Bitcoins in a two week period, the protocol will dole out 12,000 and change uh, Bitcoins. And that's going to be true whether or not there's no other blocks that got orphaned in that two week period at all. It's still going to be 12,000 and change if there's a thousand other blocks that did get orphaned in that two week period. So the amount of block reward being given out um, in a two week period, at least, you know, if the protocol is meeting its target, um, is fixed. And so that just means that, you know, a node's goal is to get the biggest share of those block rewards, or equivalently, its biggest possible share of the blocks on the longest chain. On the other hand, suppose there was no difficulty adjustment at all. Suppose the difficulty just stayed constant. So there was just some fixed difficulty threshold tau that always remained the same. So that means, you know, you as a node, you're going to just be producing new blocks at some rate, right? So maybe you'll on average produce a new block once every six hours. Your hash rate's fixed, the difficulty threshold's fixed. So that's going to be true for the rest of time. One block on average every six hours. The block you produce, you get six and a quarter Bitcoins if it winds up on the longest chain. You get zero if it doesn't wind up on the longest chain. So what do you want to make sure? You just want to make sure every one of your blocks winds up on the longest chain. You do not care what other blocks are on the longest chain because there's no difficulty adjustment. You do not care. You just want all of your blocks to make it onto the longest chain so you get a block reward for every block you ever produce. How do you do that? you honestly follow the longest chain consensus. If all of the nodes are following the protocol, honestly, uh, at least in this super synchronous model we're working in, uh, there's no forks. Everybody gets their blocks in the longest chain, and there's no reason to deviate from that for any reason. So I think this third answer is probably also a meaningful deterrent, um, right? Like the, the, the payoff is just much more delayed than in a lot of the other attacks you might um, pull off on a blockchain protocol, right? You have to wait two weeks for it to even matter. During that two weeks, the attack might get noticed. You know, who knows what else, you know, happens? Who knows how the community responds during those two weeks? Um, so it just seems like kind of a, a, a risky thing to do. Right, and then to expand on that point, right, independent of sort of the delayed benefit, you know, just in general, if you sort of tried to do this deviation and it was noticed, it's just hard to know how other nodes would respond. So remember, the benefit of the attack assumes that all the other nodes um, keep following the protocol honestly. And if they notice that you are not doing that, maybe they are also not going to do that. And then it is not clear what happens to your share of the block rewards. So while we are these days seeing plenty of examples of um, protocol participants sort of deviating from intended behavior uh, for profit maximization reasons to sort of reap more reap more benefits uh, for themselves, generally that's happening um, in scenarios where the payoff is much more immediate um, and where there's much less risk of sort of some kind of countermeasures uh, interfering with uh, with your benefits. Especially since like 2020, when we had the rise of uh, DeFi, decentralized finance on the Ethereum blockchain, 
Um, since then, it's hard to imagine, like if you were the type of person or organization that wanted to just sort of steal other people's money um, using blockchain technology, it's hard to imagine why you'd bother sort of like accruing a whole bunch of Bitcoin hash rate and sort of doing these sort of sophisticated sort of, you know, forking strategies and so on. Uh, much simpler, unfortunately, um, as we've seen over the last couple of years, um, to just target sort of the weak link in some kind of, you know, part of the DeFi stack um, and uh, accrue economic rewards um, through exploiting those. Now, I don't want any of you to sort of um, believe that the last two hours have been a waste of time just because these kinds of selfish mining deviations aren't generally observed in the wild. What we've learned in this lecture in Lecture 10 um, is fundamental and important for a number of reasons. Right, so the first reason is just that this paper, I think, really made it obvious to everybody uh, the importance of game theoretic analysis uh, in the analysis of blockchain protocols. Right, because remember, the roots of blockchain protocols, they go back to the classic consensus protocols studied in the 1980s and the 1990s. You know, and so those are blockchain protocols that didn't have, you know, any native currency. There was sort of no real economics. All of the nodes running the protocol were just sort of owned generally by some big company. Um, and so it was sufficient for the 20th century applications to have this simple dichotomy between nodes that obediently follow the protocol without worrying about why they might be doing that. Uh, and then Byzantine nodes or faulty nodes that sort of might mess up the protocol. And if you apply those frameworks, for example, the longest chain consensus, as we saw in lecture eight, you find that there's this magical threshold at 50%, right? So if uh, at least 50% of the, of the nodes or of the hash rate um, is honest, then you get consistency, you get liveness, you get, we thought at the time, everything that you want. The analysis in this lecture, meanwhile, says, look, 21st century consensus protocols in a blockchain context, generally, they don't have to, but generally they have a native cryptocurrency. And generally, that cryptocurrency is used in part to incentivize participants of the protocol to behave in a particular way. And as soon as you do this, it does not make sense to just model nodes as this honest or Byzantine dichotomy. Because there's, be there's going to be nodes that have no interest per se in breaking your protocol, but nonetheless are happy to deviate from the intended behavior uh, if it makes them better off. What this lecture demonstrates is that the difference matters, specifically for Nakamoto consensus. What we learned in lectures eight and nine is that if you're happy with the just dichotomy between honest and Byzantine nodes as appropriate for a blockchain protocol without a cryptocurrency, without block rewards, then you just need sort of um, non-honest hash rate to be below 50% to get all of the properties that we were shooting for. Here in lecture 10, we see that actually if you do have a native cryptocurrency, if you are rewarding participants with block rewards, then actually that threshold changes. You need to make stronger assumptions um, about the fraction of non-honest hash rates to conclude that the nodes are going to be behaving the way you intended. So that's a big deal. I mean, this demonstrates you just cannot analyze blockchain protocols the way that we analyze 20th century uh, consensus protocols. No serious analysis of a blockchain protocol uh, in the 21st century would be complete without an analysis of the game theory faced by its participants. To be fair, you know, in the 2009 Bitcoin white paper, Nakamoto already was thinking about um, sort of game theory uh, for nodes running the protocol and gave sort of a, a sketch of an argument um, about why nodes running the protocol should be incentivized to um, behave honestly um, unless they have more than 50% of the hash rates. Uh, and so the reason, you know, Nakamoto got a different finding than Eyal and Sarir is Nakamoto was using a more limited um, strategy space for deviating nodes. In particular, Nakamoto focused on deviations that involved extending a part of the blockchain other than the longest chain. Nakamoto, it would seem, did not consider um, the type of deviation that's been super important in this lecture, which is the possibility of nodes um, creating blocks, keeping them secret, um, extending secret chains in order to later orphan um, honestly produced blocks. So another byproduct then of the analysis in this lecture is that, you know, the fidelity with which you model the strategy space also really matters. Okay, if you don't allow um, nodes to delay block announcements, uh, then you've got the analysis from the Bitcoin white paper that shows that everything's fine up to the threshold of 50%. But here in this lecture, we looked at a, a richer but very realistic strategy space, right? Nodes running sort of, this, for example, the Bitcoin protocol really could do these strategies if they wanted, uh, and it matters. The threshold changes. It moves lower. You need to, you need to make a stronger assumption about the fraction of non-honest hash rate.
Right, so finally, let me let me sort of zoom out a little bit. So lecture 10, we've been focusing on a fairly specific type of deviation for a fairly specific type of blockchain protocol, namely one um, using Nakamoto consensus. You know, but the big picture point here is this, this is sort of a, a cautionary tale, right? So really, just really broadly speaking, anywhere in the blockchain stack, if you are um, providing meaningful economic rewards with protocol participants, uh, you really need to think about what behavior, behavior you are incentivizing. And it may well not be the behavior that you thought you were incentivizing. And even if we just focus on you know, the incentives faced by the nodes running a blockchain consensus protocol, um, most of those nodes in a modern blockchain are actually earning revenue from three different streams. And each of those revenue streams has its own incentive issues, uh, as we'll see as this, as this lecture series unfolds. So the first revenue stream is exactly the one we've been talking about uh, in this lecture. Often you're rewarded um, just for block production. Uh, and as we've seen, that can, you know, in the Nakamoto consensus context, introduce um, sort of dangerous incentives to engage in these selfish mining style deviations. The second source of revenue for nodes um, above and beyond the block reward would be from transaction fees. So this we'll talk about uh, in the next lecture, lecture 11. Um, but you know, off modern blockchain protocols typically charge for usage. So for each transaction included, some transaction fee is paid uh, for inclusion. And so obviously, you know, the blockchain protocol has to somehow determine what those fees are, how much each transaction should pay. And that also introduces some quite tricky incentive issues. Uh, and that'll be the focus on our discussion of transaction fee mechanism design in the next lecture, in lecture 11. So the third revenue stream collected by nodes running a modern blockchain consensus protocol above and beyond any block rewards, above and beyond any transaction fees, uh, is revenue coming, you know, in effect from the transactions themselves that get included in blocks. There's sort of maybe two flavors of this. So one is value that just um, accrues off chain. Uh, the other version being sort of value you just get directly on chain. So like a double spend attack would be an example of value you get off chain um, due to transactions included in a block. Right, so if a transaction gets included in a block that allows you in the real world to sort of drive off as the owner of a Tesla, um, and then later you sort of arrange things so that that block gets rolled back and you get your you get your money back, that would be an example of deriving off-chain value from the transactions included uh, uh, on-chain, potentially in a block that you yourself produced. The other variant would be where you know transactions in a block, for example, in a block that you yourself produce, um, if that somehow gets you revenue directly uh, on chain. So in effect, maybe you're sort of siphoning some of the revenue um, that's coming from the application layer. This idea really rose to prominence um, with the rise of DeFi, so decentralized finance on Ethereum. Like if you, if what you imagine is that a lot of these transactions are kind of trades on exchanges, you could imagine you can imagine um, putting your own trades in a block and then or ordering the transactions in that block so that you get your own trades uh, at favorable prices. This is an example of what's sometimes um, called MEV. Uh, we'll talk about that concept at greater length sort of at the very end um, of the lecture series. Uh, but this general challenge, you know, that sort of nodes can siphon revenue off of the application layer, it's actually one of the biggest challenges, I'd say, um, facing uh, modern blockchain protocols, speaking now in, in, in late 2022. All right, so that's it for lecture 10. That's it for selfish mining. Uh, let's move on to lecture 11, which is going to be about transaction fee mechanism design with a case study uh, on Ethereum's EIP 1559. So I'll see you there.